On June 4, 1981, an unidentified body of a young woman was found on the grassy shoulder of Interstate 35 North near a rest area in Commel County, Texas. An autopsy later determined the victim died from numerous gunshot wounds. There was also bruising on her neck, leading investigators to believe the suspect was forcibly holding or restraining the victim's neck. Although some of her clothes had been removed, investigators said there was no indication that she had been sexually assaulted. They attempted to identify her by her fingerprints and from missing persons reports in the surrounding areas, but never could. The Jane Doe was ultimately buried in a New Braunfels, Texas cemetery. In 2009, through DNA technology, the victim was identified as 18-year-old Carol Delian. Carol was born on February 18, 1963, and at the time of her death, lived in the West Avenue area of San Antonio and had just graduated from Thomas Edison High School just a week before her death. She was never seen again after visiting a nightclub in San Antonio on June 3, 1981. Fingernail scrapings that were collected during her autopsy would be used in 2010 to create a DNA profile of the suspect. However, no matches were found in the CODIS database. In 2019, 38 years after the murder, another sample of DNA was collected from her body and matched the DNA collected from the fingernail scrapings. That DNA was then submitted for genealogy testing and identified three persons of interest, including Larry Allen West. In November 2021, Texas Rangers visited West at his workplace, and he voluntarily gave investigators a swab of his DNA. According to police documents, West told investigators that in 1981, he would often visit bars in Bexar County to pick up younger women but denied killing Carol. Finally, in March 2023, investigators with the Texas Rangers said they received the DNA analysis report revealing that West's DNA matched the DNA from the crime scene. On April 13, 2023, West was arrested and charged with Carol's murder. After his arrest, investigators also interviewed his ex-wives, who described him as very violent According to an arrest warrant, his first wife told investigators she was only married to West for 30 days, and during that time, he physically and sexually assaulted her repeatedly. Rachel Zendejas was born on November 20, 1960, and raised in Modesto, California, and was the youngest of six siblings. When she was in high school, her family moved to Camarillo, California. When Rachel was 20 years old, she moved into her brother Roy Rodriguez's apartment in the 700 block of Mobile Avenue in Camarillo. She was a single mother of two daughters, ages one and two, and was earning a degree from Oxnard College. On January 17, 1981, she and a friend had gone out dancing at Huntington's nightclub at Wagon Wheel Junction in Oxnard while a babysitter cared for her two girls. Afterward, she dropped the babysitter off at home and returned to her apartment complex. After parking her car in the parking lot, she never made it inside. The next morning, two newspaper delivery boys found Rachel's nude body in a carport across the street. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Investigators theorized that an unknown assailant attacked Rachel as she got out of her car. Nearly a year later, on December 11, 1981, another woman, 21-year-old Connecticut native Lisa Gondek, was murdered after leaving the same nightclub as Rachel did the night of her murder. Investigators believe the two murders, which occurred 11 months apart, were connected. In 1981, Lisa took the bus across the country to visit a friend in the Navy. She loved California so much that she decided to stay and rented an apartment in the 1200 block of West Gonzalez Road. She then got a retail job at the Esplanade Mall. On December 12, 1981, the Oxnard Fire Department responded to a fire at her apartment. When firefighters extinguished it, they found Lisa's deceased body inside her bathtub. She had been strangled to death, and her body was posed in a sexual manner. Although her apartment had been set on fire, detectives were still able to retrieve DNA from a bite mark on Lisa's cheek. 
Before the suspect left, he apparently took her driver's license with him. With very few leads to go on, both cases would go unsolved for the next four decades. In 2004, DNA evidence from Lisa's case was compared against the DNA from Rachel's case, and it was a match. Finally, in late 2019, investigators from the Ventura County Cold Case Unit decided to use genetic genealogy, and lo and behold, this led them to suspect Tony Garcia. Garcia was born in 1954 in Roswell, New Mexico, and enlisted in the U.S. Navy, where he was assigned to Naval Base Ventura County. After leaving the Navy in 1980, he settled in Ventura County, working jobs including karate instructor and carpenter. On February 7, 2023, 68-year-old Garcia was arrested following a five-year joint investigation between the Ventura County Sheriff's Office, Ventura District Attorney Office Investigations Bureau, and the Oxnard Police Department. Some speculate that he was a bouncer or bartender at the Huntington's nightclub and after checking their IDs, possibly took note of the women's addresses and attacked them after they returned home. Tegan Alyssa Skiba was born on July 6, 2006 to parents Helen Rays and Jerry Skiba. At the age of four, she was living in Smithfield, North Carolina with her mother, Helen, and Helen's boyfriend, Jonathan Richardson. Her father, Jerry, was behind bars for a felony and not involved in Tegan's upbringing. Nevertheless, Tegan was described as full of life and her favorite color was purple. She also loved butterflies and enjoyed catching ladybugs in her grandmother's garden. They lived in a barn on Jonathan's grandparents' property, and it lacked basic amenities such as running water and a bathroom. The only bedding available was an air mattress on the floor. Much like Jerry, Richardson also had a criminal record, including an incident in 2007 when he broke the windshield of his then-girlfriend's car during an argument and drove while impaired. On July 6, 2010, Tegan was left in the care of Richardson, while her mother went to New Mexico for Army Reserves training. Ten days later, on July 16th, Richardson brought Tegan to UNC Hospitals at Chapel Hill, and upon examination, they found she had severe bodily injuries. Richardson's excuse was that Tegan had fallen out of bed. Upon closer inspection, however, they found that Tegan was covered in numerous bite marks and cuts and had suffered severe head trauma. There was also evidence that Tegan had been tortured and sexually assaulted. Police were immediately called to the hospital, and soon after, Richardson was arrested on a felony child abuse charge. Meanwhile, medical staff worked tirelessly to try and save Tegan, but a couple of days later, she tragically succumbed to her injuries. Although her injuries were numerous, Tegan's ultimate cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. The child abuse investigation quickly turned into a murder investigation, and detectives began a search of the barn and a room inside Richardson's grandparents' home, where he sometimes stayed. They seized guns, knives, duct tape, and drug paraphernalia. Richardson told investigators he had become angry when Tegan wet the bed they were sharing. His sorry ass said he lost it and whipped her with an electrical cord. He said he was bipolar and that little things would set him off. He was subsequently charged with felony first-degree murder and was ordered to be held without bond. Helen was also interviewed in the aftermath of her daughter's death, and she claimed to investigators that she was afraid of Richardson. As details of Tegan's murder were made public, the Army commented that if Helen needed help with child care during her training, all she had to do was ask. In addition, as a single mother, she was required to develop a family care plan that outlined how her daughter would have been cared for. She listed her mother, Maria Rays, as the sole caretaker for Tegan while she was away. Wake County child welfare officials determined that Helen had failed to protect her daughter and entrust her to an appropriate caretaker before she left for training. She was subsequently charged with negligent child abuse, causing serious bodily injury. An investigation into her involvement in her daughter's abuse uncovered that she knew about the abuse being inflicted. 
On one occasion, she had watched as Richardson forced Tegan to chug a Corona and two natural light beers. Moreover, she knew that Richardson had beaten Tegan while she traveled to a convenience store. Detectives also learned that Helen watched Richardson whip Tegan, yet did nothing to help or protect her daughter. The investigation into her involvement continued, and investigators learned that Helen didn't just know her daughter was being abused, she had an active role in the abuse. She had subjected Tegan to verbal threats and intimidation, and she had forced her to consume alcohol and had even subjected her to physical beatings and had bitten her. According to investigators, the sexual abuse happened after Helen had left for training. The sheriff also announced that there was nothing to indicate that Richardson's grandparents didn't know about the abuse going on in the barn on their property. During the trial, a video was shown to jurors that showed Tegan facing a wall and repeating a half dozen times, when I have to pee, I promise I will tell someone. Richardson could then be heard yelling for Tegan to speak up. This 37-second video was taken at 2.31 a.m. on July 10, 2010, six days before her death. The prosecutors called on witnesses who testified about Tegan's condition in the hospital. Nurse Mary Butler revealed that when she saw the injuries inflicted on Tegan, she was so emotionally overcome that she confronted Richardson in the emergency room. She said she jumped on top of him, grabbed him, and tried to rip out his throat. Through tears, she said, it was horrible. We see a lot of stuff. At that point, I couldn't take it anymore. Dr. Keith Kokus told the jury that he had never seen injuries like those he saw on Tegan on any child in his 25 years as a doctor. A crime scene investigator testified that the barn they lived in was littered with trash and feces and smelled of urine. In a photograph presented to the jury, Tegan could be seen with a black eye. In another picture, Tegan is seen sitting in a car seat, eyes half-closed, with a cigarette dangling from her lips. In front of her is a pack of Marlboros and a can of Budweiser. Helen said Jonathan posed the shot while the three were on a trip to Carolina Beach. In the end, Jonathan Richardson was convicted and sentenced to death for the murder of Tegan. In 2019, Helen pleaded guilty to child abuse, admitting she showed reckless disregard for the welfare of the child, resulting in serious bodily injury. She was sentenced to 18 to 31 months in prison. Seventy-five-year-old Richard Finney was retired and lived alone in an apartment at 326 East Mission Avenue in Escondida, California. Richard was paralyzed on one side of his body at the time due to a stroke. His granddaughter described him as a charming, lovely man who always had a quick wit. Tragically, on November 13, 1986, a home health employee found him in a living room chair in his apartment, stabbed to death in what investigators would describe as an overkill. Money, jewelry, and a portable radio belonging to Richard had been stolen from the apartment. Other stolen items, such as a bathrobe, a towel, bars of soap, and a mustache trimmer, led investigators to believe the killer was possibly homeless. When the killer fled the scene, he apparently dropped some of the stolen items as he ran through the neighborhood. At the crime scene, investigators found a bloody handprint on the wall, two knives, and fingerprints. The blood from the handprint was checked, and two different blood types were found, one being Richard's. Even though DNA technology at the time was lacking, investigators still collected and preserved the evidence from the crime scene. Unfortunately, with very few leads to go on, the case would go cold for the next 32 years. In 2007, the case was reopened by a retired Escondido detective and a retired FBI agent. Fingerprint expert Cassandra Barnes was brought in and was able to enhance the original crime scene photos of a fingerprint found on a bathroom sink faucet. From there, the DNA and fingerprint were uploaded into national databases. The DNA profile cleared several potential suspects, including transient Richard Toot, who was convicted in the 1998 stabbing death of 12-year-old Stephanie Crow. 
In 2016, the department's forensics team took the enhanced photos and compared them against modern fingerprint databases. This led investigators to suspect 62-year-old Nathan Eugene Mathis. They then were able to obtain Mathis's DNA and compared it against the DNA from the bloody handprint, and it was a match. Mathis, who spent much of his career as a security officer, was arrested in April 2018 at his home in Ontario, California, where he lived with his wife and two grandchildren. Investigators believe Mathis lived in Escondida at the time of the murders and also spent time in Texas. He ultimately pleaded guilty to the crime and was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. At Mathis's sentencing hearing, two of Richard's granddaughters spoke of the impact the killing had on them and their family, particularly their mother and uncle, who died before knowing the outcome of the investigation. At the age of 68, Leo Beauregard lived at a condominium in Unit 502 at 100 Paradise Harbor Boulevard off US-1 in North Palm Beach, Florida. On June 29, 1990, Leo was discovered with a fatal knife wound to his neck, slumped back in a chair in his living room. Investigators found an empty bush beer can on a table next to the victim. While other items on the table, such as a glass ornament, a notebook, and a lamp were all covered in blood, the beer can was not, meaning the killer likely drank the beer after the murder took place. Inside the notebook were handwritten notes on several dates. The note on June 26 read, Mark's birthday. Another note read, Mark Phoenix House, and included an address in Michigan and the number 179-237. At the time of the murder, police said several items, including Leo's wallet, a bracelet, and a ring were missing. Investigators were able to produce a sketch of the suspect, but despite an extensive investigation, the case would go cold for 30 long years. A cold case squad with North Palm Beach Police reopened the case in 2018. The following year, in 2019, the sheriff's office reported that DNA taken from the mouth of the beer can found at the crime scene was a possible match to Mark Stephen Gribben, who was now living in Ohio. Prosecutors told jurors that the two men knew each other, noting that Gribben, inmate 179-237, left a state prison facility called the Phoenix House on parole in 1990 and had his parole transferred to West Palm Beach on June 1, 1990. In addition, the inmate number, Gribben's date of birth of June 26, 1963, and the reference to the prison facility all matched the notes found in Leo's notebook. In early 1990, Gribben spent time in prison in Michigan and Ohio after being convicted of burglary and robbery. After being released, his parole was transferred to West Palm Beach in June of that year, and he lived with his mother for about two months, about five miles from Leo's home. In early 2020, North Palm Beach investigators traveled to Gribben's home to question him and obtain his DNA. Gribben admitted he was living with his mother in West Palm Beach, but denied knowing Leo or having ever been in his home. The Palm Beach County Public Defender's Office, which represented Gribben, argued that North Palm Beach police investigators in 1990 lacked sufficient DNA knowledge to process the scene properly. Assistant Public Defender Courtney Wilson also told jurors that the village's police department failed to maintain evidence records properly. For example, she pointed to the department's decision in 1992 to send the beer can and a blood-stained towel recovered from the scene to psychic Noreen Rayner. Jurors were then shown a video recording of Noreen handling the items without gloves. Regardless, a jury convicted Gribben on a charge of first-degree murder, and Circuit Judge Delia Weiss immediately sentenced him to life in prison. (laughs) 